So how do we keep from veering into exegetical fallacies? How do we handle passages of scripture that are difficult or where Christians have differing views on them, on specifics of the passage, where the exegesis of a particular passage can yield different results? What do we do then? Well, that's where I would recommend InterVarsity Press's Hard Sayings of the Bible. This is by Walt Kaiser, Peter Davids, F.F. F. Bruce, and Manfred Brock. This is basically a handbook that goes through book by book, and it pulls out passages that people puzzle over from every book. It's not exhaustive. It doesn't have every passage of every book. But if there's a passage in a book that has drawn significant confusion or discussion, there will probably be a section on it in this handbook. And especially useful are the essays at the beginning. After the general introduction, the essays cover things like, how do we know who wrote the Bible? Can we believe in the Bible miracles? Why does God seem so angry in the Old Testament and loving in the New? Why don't Bible genealogies always match up? Aren't many Old Testament numbers wrong? Do the dates of the Old Testament kings fit secular history? Does archaeology support Bible history? There's about 12 of these essays right at the beginning before then they jump into the biblical books. And the strength of this volume for me is even when I find myself not agreeing with a particular take on a particular passage, and there are a few of those in here, the discussion of how interpreters get to that view and what other interpreters out there think, for the most part, it's really, really good. And it's a helpful starting point to then be able to dig deeper on my own and come to some kind of conclusions on a passage. So I definitely recommend this volume to have on the shelf. Another recommended resource, Bible background text. Now, this is an example of one. This is the IVP Bible background commentary for the New Testament. Uh, it has a newer cover since then. This is a prior edition. This is the New Testament by Craig Keener. There's an Old Testament companion that goes along with this by John Walton. I recommend both of those as a set. I just only have this copy handy to show you. But this basically goes through, there are some opening essays and then it goes through the books of the New Testament in this case, and it gives background information on every verse that's pertinent or relevant. So this is almost like a commentary, not a full commentary that walks through every phrase, but it pretty much follows at least every chapter. It has some background information from the world of the New Testament that helps make sense contextually of what you're reading in the text. So I definitely recommend this volume and the Old Testament volume by Walton as a set to own. Another helpful resource is a good Bible dictionary. Now, I, again, I just have this one handy as a hard copy, but this is from a set by InterVarsity IVP. They have a set. There's things like Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, Dictionary of the New Testament and its later developments, Dictionary of the Old Testament Pentateuch, Dictionary of the Old Testament Wisdom Literature. It's just a list of dictionaries. So if you've had all these on the shelf, you know, this would be like a whole shelf. But in each one, scholars who focus in this area, so in this case, this is the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters. These are all Pauline scholars. They write an essay or do an entry on all manner of things having to do with Paul and his letters. This is the prior edition. There's a new edition of this out. I have it on Lagos. I don't have it in a hard copy, but it's by our friend Nijay Gupta. He is the editor, he and Scott McKnight. But this one is still an excellent resource. So even if you only can get this one, you're still getting fantastic biblical scholarship. And this is based on entries. It's a dictionary. It's not a commentary. So they're alphabetically arranged. Like here's the one on the intermediate state. So what did Paul believe about what happens between death and the resurrection? Here's an article on justification, Paul's view of justification. And at the end of each article, then there's a bibliography. So Alistair McGrath wrote this article and there's a bibliography of all of these works, more technical works that have to do with this subject. So every article, you can follow up and read more about that particular aspect that you're researching. This is a fantastic set. You can get this digitally 
for either accordance or logos, or you can buy hard copies if you like paper and books on shelves. Now, there are two more categories of resources that I want to look at. These are going to just be samples because there's no way that we can cover a even remotely comprehensive view of commentaries and biblical theologies or books, monographs. There's just too much. So I'm going to give you some examples that I've found helpful. And if you're studying any of these books of the Bible that I touch on, then I think these would be worth having on the shelf. Similar to the background commentary that we just looked at, there's a fuller illustrated edition, the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary. This is for the Old Testament. There's also a New Testament version. And they're basically illustrated and expanded multi-volumes of this. So this is kind of like the cliff notes. This is more detail. This one in particular edited by John Walton, but the contributors for each of the biblical books are different based on what book it is. So for instance, you have Joshua and then things that have to do with the background of Joshua, timeline of what's going on in the other empires, then archeological reliefs, insights from Egyptian or Mesopotamian culture that sheds light on the text. These are just great. They really do help you get back into the ancient world, and they're done book by book. So then you come to Judges, things that have insight in the world of Judges. Ruth, 1 Samuel, and 2 Samuel. So there are volumes that cover the entire Old Testament in this series. I believe there are five total, and then there's a set that covers the New Testament. Definitely recommend if you can get your hands on these, again, either digitally or in print. Another thing that's helpful are one volume commentaries. Now, in particular, global one volume commentaries. This is the South Asia Bible commentary. I also have the Africa Bible commentary. I believe there is a Middle East Bible commentary, although I don't think it's been published in English yet. But these are done by contributors, in this case, South Asia, all of the contributors, it's just a one volume commentary. So it just goes through the books of the Bible and comments on each one. But in particular, this one, all of the commenters are from South Asia. So Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, they are coming at the text from their cultural perspective and what scripture says in that context. The Africa Bible commentary does the same thing for an African context. And the reason that I recommend these is because it helps get us who are North Americans or Western Europeans out of that default mindset that we filter everything in Scripture through. And issues that aren't a big deal to us, that don't matter very much at all in our society, can matter significantly in these societies. Things like honor and shame, things like family relationships, kinship, primogenitor, polygamy, ancestor worship. These are things that Christians in the majority world have to face on a regular basis that Christians in Western context often don't. So that's why I recommend, it doesn't have to be this one in particular, although this one's good, but South Asia Bible Commentary, Africa Bible Commentary, I believe there's a Central European Bible Commentary, and I think there's an East Asian Bible Commentary. I'm not 100% sure, but you can find out by checking out Langham Partnership. That's who publishes these along with Zondervan. So if you go to Langham Partnership, they can give you info on what's available out there. Then if you're looking for a more general commentary on particular books of the Bible, I would recommend a set like The Bible Speaks Today. That's the Bible Speaks Today, The Message Of. So if you look these up on Amazon or Google, BST, Bible Speaks Today is the series, and the title of each one is The Message Of, and then whatever the book is. This is Chris Wright's volume on Jeremiah. These are wonderful overviews of a particular biblical book. These are not written at a scholarly level, but they are written by phenomenal scholars. Chris Wright, for instance, he's one that I think you should read everything he ever writes. Just absolutely brilliant. These are good resources if you lead a small group, if you teach a Sunday school class, or you're leading a Bible study, and you want to study a book of the Bible, this is a great starting point. And then from here, the deeper you want to go, that's when you would look at the resources in the bibliography that would take you deeper into specific passages or sections of the book. So I really like this set overall, even when I find myself disagreeing with the commentator on a particular issue. This is a helpful set, and it covers both Old Testament and New Testament. 
I believe John Stott was the editor for the New Testament, and J. A. Metyer is the editor for the Old Testament. Now, some books are tricky to find commentaries on because they're so small, in particular the Minor Prophets. So, here is, this used to be three volumes, now it's been published as a one-volume set. But this is edited by Thomas McMiskey. McMiskey? I never know how to say his name right. I think it's McMiskey. Anyway, this is a great volume that covers all of the minor prophets. It has a translation of the passage that they're looking at, and then it has textual notes on the translation at the top, and then it has commentary notes, like interpretive notes at the bottom. So this assumes you have some familiarity with Hebrew. You can see here they use the Hebrew terms in the text itself. And so this is why those resources like I recommended, Hebrew for the rest of us, for instance, are helpful. But you don't have to be able to read all of this technical information to get something from the interpretive section of the commentary. But this is a really good one volume that covers all of the minor prophets, and that's not always easy to find. Usually you have to buy a bunch of different commentaries. And so having all of the minor prophets in one volume, and this is by different interpreters. It's not just McMiskey that wrote all of these. Each prophet has a different contributor and some that stand out. Jeff Niehaus on Amos and Obadiah. Jeff Niehaus was one of my professors, phenomenal Old Testament scholar. Joyce Baldwin on Jonah. Bruce Waltke on Micah, Trimper Longman on Nahum, F.F. Bruce on Habakkuk, Alec Metyer on Zephaniah and Haggai, and then again, Doug Stewart on Malachi. So in terms of the scholars involved, the format, and just the overall usefulness, this should be a go-to if you want to understand and study the minor prophets in detail. When it comes to Revelation, I have an entire shelf behind me of Revelation commentaries, but I just want to point out one in particular, and that is this one by Steve Gregg, Revelation 4 Views, a parallel commentary. And the reason I'm going out of my way to point out this specific commentary is because Revelation there are about four different ways you can read Revelation, technically five if you count the uh, eclectic approach, but four, at least four main ways that people have read Revelation throughout history. So this commentary basically lays those four ways out in their own column. So you can see you're going to get the historicist view and the preterist view and the futurist view and then the spiritual view, which is what they call kind of the idealist. But for each section of the book, you have the text that's being looked at. So the name of the section. So this is the first trumpet. It gives you the chapter and the verse. And then there's the verse itself. And then it lets the four different views say how they interpret that verse. And with Revelation, this is critical to understand because how you read Revelation will determine how you interpret Revelation. And so having all four approaches handy, incredibly helpful. Now for a lot more on resources that help understand Revelation better, check out our playlist here on Disciple Dojo. We have an entire playlist on understanding the book of Revelation. And in one of those, I actually go into more detail about particular Revelation commentaries and resources that are very helpful. All right, so let's do one more category of reading resources that I would recommend, and that is biblical theology. Overall content of Old Testament, New Testament, and the Bible as a whole. Putting it all together, not in the way of systematic theology, where you lay things out according to different uh, categories that you bring to the text, but actually unfolding what the text itself says in a way that spans from Genesis to Revelation. So here are some biblical theological resources I would highly recommend. For the Old Testament, a great overview is Carol Kaminsky's book. It's called Casket. Now, Casket, and you see empty under here because Casket is the Old Testament volume, and Empty is the New Testament volume. I haven't used Empty. I'm not familiar with it. I'm just familiar with Casket. But together, they, it's a program called Casket Empty, and it comes from this timeline that comes with it where they lay out all of the biblical events using the acronym Casket. So, Creation, Abraham, Sinai, Kings, Exile, Temple. So that's casket. And what Carol Kaminsky does really great in this is gives a big picture overview. If you've seen our Old Testament timeline coffee mug here in the studio, this book takes much the same approach where you lay out the big picture 
and give people a bird's eye view of the Old Testament while also situating the particular things happening in the time that they're happening in. So she does it through these different epics. So the creation epic, she talks all about the stuff in Genesis 1 through 11. Then in the Abraham section, she starts talking about the stuff in the rest of Genesis. And then when you get to Sinai, all the events surrounding the Exodus and the conquest into the promised land. Then when you come to Kings, there's two sections on the monarchy, the United Monarchy and the Divided Monarchy. Now, of all the sections in this book, this to me is the best section. These two on Kings, because she does very well what many Old Testament textbooks struggle to do. She places the different prophets along with the different Kings and tells it in a chronologically, but easy to understand way so that by the time you're done reading it, you have a pretty good idea of the general flow of that section in Israel's history, the monarchy. And then she does the same thing for the exile and then for the rebuilding of the temple. So I can't say anything about empty because I've never used that volume. It's by somebody else, but casket by Carol Kaminsky. This is a great introductory resource. This is created for lay people, for interested lay people who want to know more about the Old Testament. When it comes to the world of the New Testament, I recommend N.T. Wright and Michael Byrd's book, The New Testament in Its World. Now, this is a big boy. This is a textbook. But what it does beautifully, fully color illustrated, it situates all of the New Testament texts in their historical cultural context. It gives follow-up reading for each book in particular, and it does a fantastic job introducing the book. It helps you see when you're reading the New Testament, here are some contextual and critical matters to pay attention to. Here's the argument of the book. Here's an outline of the book. And this is written for a relatively educated audience, but not requiring any knowledge of the languages. The only drawback to this is it's unwieldy and it's expensive. But remember, a lot of good tools are expensive. So if you're able to, I highly recommend this. You can also get it digitally as well and save on the heft because this bad boy is heavy. Now, I would also recommend a series, and this is one of the volumes of the series. This series, the NSBT, New Studies in Biblical Theology. Some people call them the gray books or the silver books because they're all this silver color. This is a fantastic series, but it is written more for a scholar or highly educated lay person to use. And by highly educated, I just mean you have experience in the world of biblical studies. These are scholarly monographs. This one is by our friend Tim Laniak, and it's on a biblical theology of shepherding. So it traces the idea of shepherds and shepherding from Genesis to Revelation, and it shows, what, in particular, his interest is how this conditions our pastoral leadership, how shepherd being the dominant image of leader in the Bible says something in and of itself to us. And so it traces shepherding imagery through the various books of the Bible in which it appears. That's what most of the volumes in this series do. They take a theme and they trace it from Genesis to Revelation. That's what biblical theology does. Systematic theology has a series of questions or categories, and then it says, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about this? And it kind of lays everything out very systematically. Biblical theology, on the other hand, takes one theme or one idea or one concept and traces it all the way through Scripture. Or it'll take a particular book of the Bible and show how it fits into the overall theological message of Scripture. So two slightly different things that biblical theology and systematic theology are trying to accomplish. But these books are excellent. I have not read one in this series that wasn't chock full of dense, nutritious biblical meat. Now, another highly overlooked and undervalued resource I want to recommend is John Bright's little book, The Kingdom of God. It's not very long. It's not super technical, but it's fantastic in tracing, just like Laniac did with Shepherding. This one traces the theme of the kingdom of God from Genesis to Revelation. And it shows how each step of the biblical meta narrative unfolds this concept that Bright thinks is the dominant concept in the Bible, the kingdom of God. This was written decades ago, but it is wonderful. 
more people should know about this resource. And even better than this, my last recommendation, Christopher writes The Mission of God. So John Bright says that you can characterize the whole biblical story through the kingdom of God. Wright takes a little more nuance and says, actually, the biggest theme in the Bible that he sees is the mission of God, that, that God's kingdom is part of God's mission. And God's mission is the underlying theme that drives all of the biblical narrative. And that's why he calls it unlocking the Bible's grand narrative. Now, this is formidable when you look at it on the shelf. It seems kind of thick, but I'm telling you, you can read this as devotional reading. It is so good. He takes the theme and he traces it all the way through scripture from Genesis to Revelation. He ties together all the strands of all the disparate books of the Old Testament, showing how it was all leading to God's missional covenant to transform the world and how God always envisioned all the nations coming to worship him. And this presents what I think is the best overview of the whole Bible story in the English language. I say that not hyperbolically. I genuinely mean that. This is, I think, the greatest book of biblical theology that I've ever read, and it's not even close. So this is an absolute must to have on your shelf. So we could sit here for hours and hours, and I could throw book recommendations your way, and this video would be way too long, and nobody would watch it. It's already probably going to be long. I'll have to cut this down a good bit. But I just wanted to give you a sampling. Just think of this as like a wine tasting or a grape juice tasting for my Methodist and Baptist friends. It's just to give you a glimpse of what's out there and to encourage you in your building of a theological library. We're called to honor God. We're called to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And part of honoring God with our mind is using our mind to the best of our abilities. You may think, I don't have time to read all these books. Well, okay, if you work a full-time job, if you've got a family, if you've got other responsibilities, yeah, you probably don't have as much time as I do to read all of these books. I mean, it's not your job. You don't do it for a living. So, of course, you don't have time to read as many books as me or uh, actual working scholars out there. But you have a lot of time. Think how many articles you've read on your phone. Think how many words you've read scrolling through Twitter or Instagram captions or Facebook discussions. Think how many songs you listen to. Think how many movies you watch or TV shows. You're taking in a lot of content, a lot of media. So the question is, how much of that content do you think is worth investing in your biblical and your theological growth. It doesn't mean you just sit around and listen to audiobooks of John Wesley sermons or Jonathan Edwards. It doesn't mean you sit around and listen to Calvin's Institutes on Audible. It doesn't mean you only read biblical books or commentaries. But what it does mean is you do more of that. You do more biblical studies. Wherever, whatever level you're at, bump it up a little bit. Switch out some of the podcasts that you listen to that are kind of feel good or entertainment, throw in some deeper digging podcasts every now and then. Subscribe to YouTube channels like The Bible Project or our friend Carmen Imes' channel or Nijay Gupta's Slow Theology podcast. Seek out biblical theological voices and listen to them. It doesn't mean agree with them. That's a hallmark here of Disciple Dojo is I regularly listen to, read from, and talk to people with whom I have serious disagreement on a number of issues, but I'm learning from them. I'm sharpening my views. I'm being corrected when I'm wrong or guided in things that I may not have noticed or seen. That's what good theological studies should do. It should not inflame pride or self-importance. It should create a hunger. It should, the more you eat, the hungrier you should get when it comes to digesting theological, biblical, solid content. There should be no distinction between head knowledge and heart knowledge, because there's not in Hebrew. It's all the same thing. That's a distinction that we have invented. So yeah, there are people who pride themselves on their reading and their erudition and their ability to pick apart arguments and all of this and that, but that's not a necessity in doing theological study. It's not inevitable. You can become in fact, some of the best biblical scholars who I know are also some of the funnest people to hang out with or talk to, or some of the warmest and welcoming, some of the nicest people. They're not quick to jump in and correct somebody's theology. 
They'll ask questions before they'll make assertions because they're lifelong students. I remember back in seminary, I took an Old Testament survey class with Gary Pratico, who would later become my Hebrew professor. And at the beginning of his first lecture in Old Testament survey, he talked about how he had spent his life as an Old Testament scholar. He had been at one point, I believe, the curator for the Harvard Ancient Near East Collection in their museum. He had literally written the textbook on biblical Hebrew that most students of biblical Hebrew in the West use today. And he was teaching this introduction to Old Testament class to probably about, I don't know, between 70 and 100 of us in the big auditorium classroom. And he said, this is what I've been doing for 50 years in my career. And he took his glasses off. He said, and I am just now becoming a student of scripture. And he wasn't doing it for affectation. He, he genuinely felt that way. He genuinely approached everything as a lifelong student. In jujitsu, once you get your black belt, Everyone who's ever earned a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu will tell you that it's at that point that they realize for the first time just how much they don't know. It was the exact same for me when I got mine. You make it to black belt and you realize there is so much that I don't know. And that drives you then to continue on and to train for the rest of your life. And that's why you have 60, 70, 80, 90 year old black belts out there still doing Jiu-Jitsu. Well, biblical studies is very similar. Once you learn, it's the people that don't know much that think they know the most. But once you really get into in-depth biblical studies, the more you read and study, the more you realize just how much you don't know. And that should then create and sustain that hunger for being, like Dr. Pratico, a lifelong student. So hopefully this video helps you as you're amassing your library. I would love to hear in the comment section below what volumes you would include if someone was asking, what should I get to build a theological library? What would you tell them? I also want to point out if space is an issue or cost is an issue, there are other ways besides having a room full of books that you're around. Here on the left is my Accordance library, and I have all of these commentaries in Accordance. It's quick, it's easy, I can search right here on the computer, I can carry it with me wherever I can carry a laptop or my iPad. So this is all just in accordance. And then this is on the right, my library in Lagos, and is very similar. You can have these thick resources, these shelf heavy resources. I like to have them digitally. And the beauty of having, whether it's Lagos or whether it's accordance, is you have access to the information, you can search the information, you can take it with you wherever you go. And you just can't do that with these books here on the shelf. If you're interested in learning more about either Accordance or Lagos, check out the reviews we've done here on the channel for both of those. I'll link them in the description below. But let me know what you think in the comments below. What did I miss? What did I leave out? What should I have included? There's no way I could do it all in a video that wasn't a bajillion hours long. So now it's your turn, Dojo viewers. Share in the comments below what you would add. And let's get like a running list of theological biblical studies resources that viewers in perpetuity, when they ever click on this video, can peruse through in the comments section. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much. Those of you that are subscribing and helping this channel grow. Remember at 10,000 subscribers, we're giving away the Anchor Bible Dictionary. And then at 20,000 subscribers by the end of the year, which is our goal, we're going to do something even cooler than that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.